This morning, I, I continue my series, We Can. Last week, I talked about we can overcome spiritual darkness and, and the battles that ra rage around us and with, uh, through pursuing that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, the storm can take place all around us, but we can have a peace inside. I grew up, even though I was a Protestant, going to Catholic school, and during uh, every week, we would have to go to Mass. Every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we went to Mass. And during the Mass, uh, the priest would say, you know, to pass the, the sign of peace. And so we would turn around and shake, and peace be with you, and also with you. It was the response, and now they've changed it. They don't say, peace be with you. It's something different. Um, Father Joe told me what it was, but I don't remember what it is at the moment. But uh, anyway, as they would say, peace be with you, you were supposed to say, and also with you. And uh, what me as a Protestant w was taking it as it was just a time to chat and go on and on. And, hey, did you catch the game last night? Yeah, it was a good game or something like that. It just kind of a uh, mingling time. And that was not what it was about at all. What it was about was to remind individuals that the peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, can be in our lives in the midst of a hellish circumstance, in the midst of the battles raging around us. We can have peace inside. And it's a reminder to others, peace be with you, to hang, hang tough, stand firm, May Christ's peace be in you. And I like that because his peace is in us when we pursue that intimacy with God. This morning, we're, we're moving on to the second in the series. This is we can become a beautiful mosaic. A mosaic is a piece of art or an image made from assemblage of small pieces of uh, colored glass, stone, or other materials placed together to create a, a unified whole. God wants to take all of our imperfections and our differences and form us into one beautiful mosaic. And this morning we're going to be looking at Acts chapter one, 2. Acts chapter 2. I don't have it on the screen this day. Uh, so if you have your, your iPhones or your droids and you have a Bible app on there, or if you want to grab a Bible in front of you, or if you want to listen, you can listen to that as well. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1. This is the, the story of the day of Pentecost. Uh, Jesus has died, rose again, told him to go back and pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And, and when the Holy Spirit comes, they would transform the world, basically. And so they've been in the upper room praying, and this is the day that Jesus had talked about, that he would give them his Holy Spirit, his presence to be with them all the time so that they could have peace in the world. And in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 through 13 and then 40 through 41, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like, a f like flames or tongues of fire, appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them the, this ability. At their, this time, there were devout Jews from every nation. That's where I'm going to be focusing on, every nation. Living in Jerusalem, when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. I, I like that. that. It says, when they heard the noise. I grew up out in the country. And when I was young, we didn't have uh, 50,000 television stations, so we didn't sit there and watch TV all day. Uh, we didn't have video games, so we had to make our own entertainment, go out and play in the woods or do whatever. And uh, with growing up out in the country, when a fire truck would be going by, we all heard the noise, and you know what would happen? Uh, my brother who had his license would jump in the car, and we'd all jump in with him, and we'd follow the fire truck to see what was going on, to see the action. There was a loud noise. A few weeks ago, uh, I got up in the morning, and I looked outside, and there was a bull sit standing on the hill eating grass across from us in a not-offensed-in area. 
And I said, Mandy, Mandy, there's a bull out there. And we thought it was one of the neighbors. And so when we left to go to work, we said, hey, Wendell, I think one of your cows got out. You know, he's on the hill. Uh, Wendell went down to check it out, and there was no cow there anymore. And later that evening, I heard, we kept hearing this weird noise. Uh, and uh, that bull had got into another farmer's field with his cows and, and was headbutting and making all sorts of noise with another bull that was there and just going on and on. And uh, next thing we, we, we go over there because we thought the noise wasn't from bulls doing that. We thought maybe a calf had gotten caught in the fence or something. And, and so we, when there was no calf caught in the fence, we came back and, we, uh, and next thing you know, uh, Wendell was at our door and he said, hey, it wasn't my bull, but it's, it's the other farmer back here. It's his bull. And I didn't see it. And I was like, well, there was a lot of noise over here in the field. Um, and, and two bulls that were button heads and everything. Maybe he's, and somehow that bull got in over there. And you know what Mandy and I did? We got the binoculars and we sat on the front porch and we spent the next 20, 30 minutes watching them get that bull crowd and, and into the truck. That was our entertainment for the evening and it was great. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, welcome to the country. We loved it. It was awesome. Well, here you have a noise that's taking place and people come running to see what the noise is. And it wasn't a fire truck. It wasn't a couple bulls. What they found were believers speaking in their languages. Verse 7 goes on and says, the people were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the provinces of Asia, Perga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and Cretans and Arabs, and we, were, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. And then skipping down to verse 40, we won't give Peter's excuse there. Uh, then Peter continued preaching for a long time. I like that long time. I think everybody should underline that in their Bibles or highlight it on their phones or something. Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Now, many pastors, when they preach on this passage, they would preach about the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives. And that is true. And it's a, it's a good message to preach because it, he does transform lives this day. But I'm wanting to focus on the fact that there were people from every nation that had gathered there. And for me, I believe that it's a picture of what heaven will look like. People from all over. And I think it's a vision that our founding fathers and modern day individuals have dreamed of as well. A country where people come together to be free. America is a melting pot. And that term was first used in 1780 and then made popular in, the, in 1908 as a metaphor describing the fusion of nationalities, cultures, ethnic, ethnicities, uh, and, and uh, all the other things put together uh, as it came popular in a play by that same name. Even our Statue of Liberty that sits in New York Harbor uh, has an inscription by Emma Lazarus which says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It was a vision for our country that people can come from all over and feel free. That's why many of you served in the military 
willing to fight for our freedoms. I never served in the military, and I was thankful there wasn't a, a draft. I was a little bit of a coward. If there would have been a draft, I was willing to go. I did register for the selective service, and I was willing to go if I had to, but I'm thankful I didn't have to. I have nephews that ha have gone. I have grandfathers that have fought and died in World War II. I have great-great-great-grandfathers great, that fought in the Civil War. You know, I was willing to fight for those freedoms, but I'm thankful I didn't have to because other men rose up and did. Fighting, and women, fighting for the vision of us being free. A vision that we enjoy this day. Today, we honor those who have fought for our freedoms. And I say, thank you. But I think this picture that we see in Acts chapter 2 is a deeper picture than just, it's a picture of what the church is to be like today. Today. I believe this morning that we can reach across racial differences. Racial differences. We can reach across them. That's your first blank in the, if you have a bulletin or taking notes. The kingdom of heaven will have people from every nationality, every color that is there. Amen. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said on April 17, 1960, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of, the, of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. That was shared 57 years ago, and it's still true to this day. We have the Korean church, the Chinese church, uh, the African Methodist church, the Anglo churches, the Haitian church, you, you name it. We have all the different groups, and we even put it on our signs so people know who we are. And I don't think that's the way heaven is going to be. It's not going to be segregated like that. In his book, One Blood, by Ken Ham, he discusses racism. He says, one of the biggest justifications for racial discrimination in modern times is the belief that people groups have evolved separately. Thus, different groups are allegedly at different stages of evolution. And so some people groups are more backwards than others. Some people would say that Southern Virginia is more backwards than others. We haven't evolved yet. I would much rather live here than up by D.C. where it's so congested and busy. I like Roanoke, except when it gets congested. Anyway, going on. Therefore, the other person may not be as fully human as you. This sort of thing inspired Hitler in his quest to eliminate Jews, and gypsies, and to establish the master race. Unquote. Sadly, some Christians have been infected with racist thinking. They think that one race is more superior than another, and these attitudes are completely unbiblical. Completely unbiblical. God is not the author of racism and prejudice, prejudice, Satan is. I believe that we can reach across racial and ethnic differences here at PFWC and become more of who God has called us to be. It may be a little bit challenging because 24018 zip code, which we live in, is 96% Anglo. But just a few years ago, it was 98%. So it is changing. But we should be a church. As Martin Luther King said, you know, they were a church that ha didn't have any white people, but white people were welcome. A and we should be welcoming to all who come in. Amen? Amen? Not only can we reach across the racial and ethnic differences, but we can reach across the generations. We can reach across the generations. The kingdom of heaven uh, it, it will have people from all different generations that are there. 
there, there will be the boomers, the busters, the millennials, you know, that's the busters. Uh, you name it, the bridgers. They'll have people from every generation and people, uh, B words that I don't even know that go on. And there will be people that enjoy every style of music uh, up there as well, except possibly uh, opera and the head-banging screamo stuff. Okay, that was me. That, 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 that might possibly be there as well, but God will have to change my heart, uh, and he will because he's in the changing business. Some people leave the church because they say there's not enough people my age there. I say, if you're an older person and you're saying that, you're missing out. Because God has called we who are older to be mentors and encouragers of the younger generations. And those of you who are younger that say that, because I've heard it from teens, middle school, or from teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, and senior adults, I've heard them all say the same thing. There's not enough people my age there. If you're a younger person saying that, you're missing out. You're missing out. Because God has called you to be an example to the believer. Uh, Paul told Timothy that. Be an example to the believers. Timothy, when Paul told him that, was probably a teenager himself. Be an example. Man, when we are young, we're, we're willing to go and, and charge against the gates of hell with a squirt gun. We have all sorts of energy and enthusiasm. And when we get old, caution comes in. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. You, you can't use a squirt gun. You, you know what's going to happen. You've got to be careful here. Uh, we need to get the fire trucks out here, and, and we have to have multitudes, masses of them. There's the gates of hell, and we, need to make, we can't just get the volunteer fire department with their water trucks because that's not going to be enough. We need to make sure we have water hydrants around, and we begin analyzing everything, and the next thing you know, nothing is being done, and we can learn from the younger people from their enthusiasm and their passions. And so young people... Older people, everybody in between, we are needed because when we get to heaven, it's going to be multiple generations that are there and we need to come together and learn from each other to be who God has called us to be. Not only can we reach across the generations, but we can also reach across denominational lines as well. I, I, I remember with going to Catholic school, Father John Kinney shared a joke or a story one day, he said there was a man that died and he went to heaven and St. Peter was giving him a tour around heaven. And as, they, as he was touring him around heaven, they went by this one room and it was a rather large room and there were all sorts of people in there partying and everything and they were being loud and they were just having a good old time and, and St. Peter told the gentleman to be quiet when they went by the door and tiptoe by. And as they got past the door, uh, the man asked St. Peter, St. Peter, why did you want me to be quiet and tiptoe by? And he's like, oh, well, that room has all the Catholics in it, and they think they're the only ones in heaven. <laughs> and that man wasn't Catholic. <sighs> you can put in whatever denominational title you want. You can put Baptist, Wesleyan, Pentecostal, Anglican, Methodist. You can put the title in, but so often, do we not kind of act like yeah, we've got a corner on the truth. And I believe what the Bible says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we are saved. And so there'll be people from all across the different denominational lines that are in heaven. Now, I am, I am partial to our church and think we're the great church and we are, no, just, you know, I am partial. But we can reach across denominational titles and lines this day. Not only can we reach across those, but we can reach across political differences as well. We've just come, come through two elections, last year and this year, and we see that we have a nation that is extremely divided. And even a, a country or a state that is divided. And I believe that in heaven there will be people from who have asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins from every different political persuasion that will be there. And what we need to be doing 
instead of going on and on and on and spending all sorts of time arguing with everybody and criticizing uh, whoever the governor or elected official or president or whatever is, we need to be spending some time doing what the Bible tells us to do. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all the people. You mean I have to pray for my Democrat friends? That's easy. You mean I have to pray for my Republican friends and my Libertarian friends? And yeah, we've got to pray for all of them. And those that don't vote, yeah, we've got to pray for them too. Ask God to help them. Oh, yeah, God to help them strike fire on them. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. What? I have to give thanks? They don't vote like I do. They're the reason we won the election or lost the election. Hmm. Pray this way for all for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We've got to come together and be praying. Spend less time criticizing and condemning and more time praying. Yes, we should go to our congressmen, our senators, or whatever, and, and let, speak out on whatever issue we're passionate about, but make sure that we're spending more time praying for them. Because, you know what? It doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or Republican, or a Libertarian or Independent. If our elected officials begin to seek God first, the right decisions will be made and God will be glorified. Because God, or a political party, is not the answer to the issues we face today, in my opinion. God is. So we can reach across political differences and we can reach across socioeconomic differences. The kingdom of heaven will have people from every socioeconomic economic background there is. Sometimes the people that, are, that don't have as much will criticize those that have. We, we say it's the haves and haves not. The, uh, we're the 99%. Criticizing the 1%. Or, or, or the people that have will be critical of, you know, well, they need to just get off their behind and get a job. Go out and work for a living. You know what? The kingdom of heaven is going to have people from every socio-economic background there is there. And we need to begin doing now what we're going to be doing for eternity, loving and respecting one another and praying for them. Because when God gave his son Jesus Christ, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. He gave it for the world, rich and poor, alike. Not only can we reach across those differences, the socioeconomic differences, but we can also reach, reach across the physical, IQ, uh, and affinities. Uh, affinities is a word that means preferences, uh, different preferences. The kingdom of he heaven will have people from many different physical differences. We'll have new bodies, so we'll be healthy, so there'll be no imperfections. But we need to reach across and start seeing people the way God sees them. That he knitted them together while they were mother, in their mother's womb. That they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Church, we can, we can reach across these areas. And if we have a problem reaching across these areas to love others, and be the church that he has called us to be. It's a red flag that there are some issues that we need to get right in our lives. Because 1 John 2.9 says, If anyone claims I am living in the light, I'm a Christian, but hates his fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Wow. Hmm. We 
can become a beautiful mosaic because we are all made in God's image. All of us. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the air of the in the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry around the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. I didn't even mention the gender and uh, male and female stuff. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. This morning, men and women have fought for the freedoms that we have. And God gave his own son, Jesus Christ. Now, they they fought for the freedoms we have out of love for country. God gave his own son, Jesus Christ, out of love for us and all humanity. And this morning, if we struggle with loving another human being, even those that have harmed us, what we need to be doing is saying, God, forgive me and help me to love them, even if they're different. Even if they're different, to love them. And let the church begin looking like, I, I don't, I know a lot of people talk about love and peace in the world, and I, I don't, for one, don't believe that it's going to take place outside of Jesus Christ. The place that it's going to ha- can happen first is in the church, in the body of Christ. But it's only when we begin to look in the mirror and say, God, change me. Change me. And help me to love. And then we'll think twice about some of the stuff that comes out of our mouth. And, and I'm reminded of the verse, or the, yeah, the verse in the Bible where Peter says, love each other deeply from the heart because love covers over a multitude of sins. And I love to paraphrase that verse and say, love covers over a multitude of annoyances. Or in this case, differences. Love each other from the heart. And if you have not experienced God's love today, today would be an incredible day to say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me and help me to pursue a relationship with you, the creator of the world. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, as we wrap the service up, I thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, took our punishment upon himself. Much as these men and women have fought for those who, like me, who did not fight for us to experience the freedoms we have today, I am indebted to them, but I'm even more deeply indebted to your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for me. Thank you. Father, I ask that you would forgive me for any attitudes that I may have towards others. And I ask that you would transform me. And may this church become a beautiful mosaic of what can be and what will be when we get to heaven. But may we begin doing now what we're going to do for all eternity gathering together as one to worship our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, to worship the creator of the world. And may you, Father, may we be willing to allow you to transform and change our lives. Thank you for the food that we are about to eat and the fellowship together. Thank you for uh, those veterans here this morning who gave 
of their time and energy. And I pray for those that face wounds that we don't see, that healing would take place. And that they would know that truly there is a country that is grateful for them. We praise you, Father. And now may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you. May he make his face to shine upon you this day and give you peace, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.